Hello, and welcome to the California Tiki Podcast, where we explore America's mid-century fascination with Polynesian idols, pineapple cocktails, and coconut palm trees. This week, for our premiere episode, we talk about Beach Party, the very first Beach Party movie, the 1963 film that brought us the pairing of Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon, but which nobody remembers actually starred Robert Cummings. Now, bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, co-author of California Tiki, coming this August from History Press. With me in Los Angeles is Adam Foschko, screenwriter and director of story development for Call of Duty, Skylanders, and the Destiny franchises, including story consultant on the recently released Destiny 2. He's also the co-author on California Tiki. Say hello, Adam. Hi, Jason. How are you tonight? Fantastic, and I'm I'm very excited to talk about uh, to talk about tiki culture and actually to dig into a really interesting place to start that also fits the time of year. Beach Party. All right, so Beach Party is a 1963 American film, which was the first of seven, or sometimes I see nine. It really depends and gets complicated, but Beach Party films or American international pictures. These movies were aimed at teens, and uh, it essentially created the beach party genre. So I wanted to get your first thoughts on what we're doing here, and particularly, I don't know if you'd watched it in a long time, what you thought of Beach Party. I did. In fact, I, wish, I rewatched it fairly recently, and if it, if it uh, makes any real difference, I'm actually standing here looking at a beach because I am in Southern California. Uh, <laughs> that, that, those beaches haven't changed much, uh, and it is about sunset where I am now, so it's the perfect time and the perfect movie to be talking about. But this is um, this is a movie that I rewatched fairly recently, uh, and I think it was an important movie because it was not because of the but how it was made or, you know, all the stuff in it. But, I mean, I think it was important because it really was, as you said, the, the, the first of its kind. And what was so fascinating, I think, was it is a remarkably, it, it promises a lot, fun, excitement, speech, very inoffensive. It's, it's, yeah. it's a very exciting movie. I can see it. And it's, that's not usual for American International, I think, particularly at that time. I think it was a real departure for them. Uh, and re-watching it, I was really surprised how, how close they got to... Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a beach surf movie about teenagers and you know bikinis and surf and you know all this. But there's really nothing bad that happens in it. There's, there's right. very little. There's no sex in it, really, to speak of. There's a lot of sort of right up against it. A lot of pretty girls. A lot of skin. A lot of you know. A lot of uh, just fun in the sun. But there's no there's no nothing lurid about it, which I think is what's so interesting. Um, yeah. Really because at the time that this was released, me. Period was a thing that um, that that was was you know being marketed to audiences in certain ways. There's a lot of the, the like the, the gangs and the bad kids and the you know and all the sure. this, um, disillusionment, the pictures that were sort of exploitation disillusionment. And this is not that at all. It's the exact polar opposite. Uh, I mean, it has, and that put a cello in it for crying out loud from Disney and Frankie Avalon. And this, I think this is the first one that they were in together. This whole notion of you know there's something that you know. That's, that's away from regular society and the kids and responsibilities and all the different things in the mores, even to a certain degree. But it was all about having fun and 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 being able to sort of get away to your own personal beach and having your own private paradise. I was I was thinking about the fact that that American International actually actually wasn't sure if this movie was going to work at all because like like you said they had been doing all the rebel movies and gang movies and and uh, and so, sort of salacious crime films and, and stuff like that and some horror movies and this is before the big American International post cycle so so their their brand was not anything like this and you know and, and in fact dorothy malone who's in the movie makes the joke that that uh you know that aip is is all about releasing movies that that really push the edge so when this was presented to samuel z arkoff and it was hey here's a script it's a it's a movie about about teenagers on the beach he thought it was too lightweight he thought it wasn't going to do any business he also thought that the 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 surf culture of young people wouldn't carry outside the west coast they very quickly on releasing it on the west coast found that it was super popular even among kids who weren't anywhere near the were anywhere near the beach 
and, and right, so, you're landlocked yeah. in Kansas. You, she's like, this is the beach. I'm like, God, I, I got to go there. Yeah, it defined, it, it sort of, uh, Americans were very, very interested in this, uh, and this is a particularly tiki culture concept, just slightly oriented towards younger people. Uh, it, you, you had an expanding economy. You had young people with a lot of extra money in their pocket. And here was a fantasy that was all about essentially middle class, unencumbered young people do, living a sort of a fantasy life. And that that created this identity that people could glom onto, this California idea that, yes, we we'll carry right. just fine in Duluth and carry just fine in Brooklyn. It, it, it didn't matter. And, and just think of it, Adam, if Beach Party hadn't done well, you know, if this had been, because what did you add before? You, you had had like Gidget, which is a very particular kind of surf movie that is not like this. It's not a party film. And it, and that series really didn't follow the surf thing after the first one. Uh, you had, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. Basically, you didn't, oh, and you had Where the Boys Are which kind of was more like this, but wasn't about surfing. This is the one that brings those movies, th those ideas together uh, into, into a, a story of a bunch of, a bunch of kids on the beach. If this movie had not gone anywhere, if it had been just a one movie experiment, just think how the culture would have changed, you know, because we've talked about how in, in the, the idea of tiki culture was this fascination with people recreating their boring everyday spaces as looking like Polynesian islands, palm trees, sand, all that stuff. Surf is an offshoot of that. That was aimed kind of at slightly younger people in the, in the sixties, starting in like 1959 or so. And, but it might not have happened if it didn't, if it hadn't happened, then there would be a big vacuum for youth culture. And now uh, it's actually very difficult for me to envision what American culture would look like if you took the surf movement out of it. Uh, it, it because, you know, just think of all the restaurants you walk into right now that have like surfboards up and, and, sure. and they're, uh, they're all all the, you know, yeah, you know, and it's, it's so, it's so strange to think that, that like the surf thing, the surf movement, Beach party movies, all this stuff, it only lasts about five years. They make these movies. When they start making Frankie and Annette movies, they make them like every six months. They churn these movies out so fast from 1963 to about 1966 that Annette Funicello is just damn tired of it by the time they are done. She she like is is like, I'm not doing these anymore. I'm tired. She was like ready to go off and have babies and, and go do other kinds of movies and whatever other projects would be available to her. They, you know, it was a grueling thing where they were doing these movies, shooting them always in like February. So they're freezing <laughs> when, when they're making these movies. And oh, right, you know, just right. imagine, it may not have happened uh, uh, at all. But I want to I want to focus in on what the movie's about. So so Beach Party, which again, 1963, the real lead. We remember Frankie and Annette, and, and they are major major characters, playing right. Frankie, uh, so called Frankie and Dee Dee. But the real lead characters of this movie are Robert Cummings and Dorothy Malone, who are thoroughly and completely uh, uh, greatest generation adults they are they are you know um, robert cummings is, plays an anthropologist it is his movie he is an anthropologist who has traveled to the beach to study the the crazy mating habits of young teenagers who he thinks are very very similar to aborigines that he's studied right. uh and uh, you know and and primitive peoples on islands and and whatever and dorothy malone who won an oscar and and uh, uh was i think just about to start working on peyton place and who is wonderful 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 she plays his long-suffering assistant and the real plot of the film is whether or not dorothy malone and bob cummings will ever get together which is by the yeah, way a foregone yeah. conclusion <laughs> and and, uh, and you know bob cummings let's see so how old are these guys so uh i looked this up bob cummings is 53 years old frankie avalon is 23 annette is 21 wow. yeah um first of all frankie avalon is 23 he looks about 30 to be honest with you i mean he, he, he like, does they both, uh, both look different ages and yeah exactly yeah looks 
fairly good. Oh, who uh, does? Despite the fact that he has the average coming, but actually surprisingly good. Despite yes. the fact that he has this crazy beard. Yes. Well, part of the big thing is, uh, yeah, the the Professor Sutwell, um, who, like Jane Goodall, sort of moving among the primitive peoples or whatever, uh, uh, he decides he's going to sort of infiltrate the young people and get to know them. And he acts, so it, like I said, it's really a story of this man, this World War II veteran and this hardworking anthropologist who wants to understand a life of freedom. That is tiki culture uh, in a nutshell. And that is, I think, what, what really makes this a tiki culture movie more than anything else. Uh, totally. is, is Bob Cummings. By the way, Bob Cummings uh, does look good when he when he shaves off the beard. He is revealed to look like Bob Cummings, and Bob Cummings was a big like like movie star already. I mean, he was a major star. He had had a he had had a very popular television series from 1955 to 1959. This is just a couple of years after that. Uh, he's 53, of course, just like. I want to say less than 20 years earlier, he had been the star of like King's Row and, and he was, he was in a lot of, a lot of major films. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it is the, the plot sort of involves, he, you know, makes his way into the life of Frankie and Annette and kind of comes between them because Annette is, is flabbergasted by his gentility and his, his kindness. Uh, but, that also, it, he's an interesting character because he has, uh, he's kind to the young people, but also he knows self-defense in ways that they don't because he's, <laughs> he's learned all of these strange native right. tricks all around the world. Um, yes. Uh, and then lastly, I suppose, the other major element of the film. So you've got the anthropologist who is studying the rituals of the teenagers. You've got Dorothy Malone, who wants to be with him. You've got the surfing people, Frankie and Annette, who want to make one another jealous. That is basically it. And then you've got a biker gang that basically just wants to terrorize everybody. And they're clowns. I mean, straight up. But they're, they're not. Yeah, they're, not. They're, not they're not. They're not serious. They're not serious. Right? They're, as, they're as much of a fantasy as, you know, as, the, as the beach line. No, Isn't that the, weird? You know, what the heck is going on with this biker gang? I mean, what what is it? it did you understand? I'm not, I'm not saying it's poor. I'm just like trying to understand. They seem to come in from another movie, but they're in a lot of this movie. What is going on with this biker gang? Well, there's no, I mean, they couldn't have anything that was serious. It couldn't be like a real threat. I mean, all the threats are very, very superficial. You have these triangles that are going on, you know, and, yeah. and you know, you had to have something. Like, what, there are a couple different threats, right? There's the, there's the they're going to close the beach. Yeah. There's going to be the there's going to be the you know, relationship trouble, which you do have, and you have that in space with multiple triangles with the relationship trouble. Right. Uh, and then you've got basically the outside influence, which would either be parents, which they weren't going to do because that that's going to be taboo in this because they're not doing misunderstood youth. Um, yeah. The authorities, no, nope, not doing that. So you have basically the criminal element, but you 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 can't the, the the bad boys, but you really couldn't go very deep with it. You couldn't make it a real threat. So, I mean, you really had these zany jokesters who were just kind of rebellious yeah. in the way they were kind of wild, but, you know, they would, kick, the worst they would do is kick down in your face. I mean, they were that kind of, yes. they were that kind of, uh, of uh, outlaw. But, I mean, that's just, a, I, I think that's just meant to, uh, the caricature of it is meant to be the lightest of threat to add a little heat to it because, you know, it gives Rob coming something to do and to protect the net against and, you know, and, 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 and make him attractive to her. Um, also, you know, she wants to kind of settle down. And he's, you know, that's what she's sort of stating in the beginning. She'd like to be a wife, which is very counter to yeah. sort of the idea of the speech movie. Um, but, you know, and he is, uh, and he is a serious person. Um, and, yes. And whatever else. I mean, that's, you know, Frankie just wants to, you know, be alone with her in a house when we start the, start the movie. Um, and Fra Frankie, she, Frankie wants to have sex with Annette. I, I find it, I find it fascinating how much uh, the movie is abundantly clear that Frankie's whole thesis for the summer is that he wants to have sex with Annette and he can't seem to close that sale because Annette is always smarter than him and she's well, holding out yeah, She the entire sex. gang to like, stay in the house where you know, he has you know, <laughs> set, it, set it up and it's, everybody's there and they're probably like, like 10 girls and like 8 guys and 
suddenly there's this, you know, uh, and she, and, but I think part of it is like that she recognizes that you know, he's not really serious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I should mention that, that the, that Robert Cummings, one thing I remembered really clearly, I couldn't find much on this online, but, you know, Robert Cummings is in great shape and that there's this joke in there where, uh, where somebody says, you know, you're quite spry for your age or whatever else they always say, but he's, you know, he's 53, which is not so old, but the point is he's running around with a bunch of teenagers essentially. And Dorothy Malone says, Oh, he takes vitamins. And that is actually an in joke because Robert Cummings was well known as one of the biggest health nuts in Hollywood. Uh, he was, you know, he was a big exerciser and he was very big on supplements. He was a big preacher of taking all, I have no idea what he was taking, but he was taking all kinds of like vitamin supplements and stuff like that. Back and then, I'm telling you, knows, I remember, right? yeah, it's well, true because it's, because this is the sixties, but I remember in the late eighties, uh, whenever Robert Cummings died, let's see, when did, when did Robert Cummings die? Hang on. Um, because I think he died finally in the 80s. Um, he died in 1990. Good God. So, yes. Wow. Um, he was 80. He was 80 years old. But what was interesting is I remember in the mid-80s, Robert Cummings, who still looked fantastic, uh, said, yeah, people used to make fun of me for uh, taking all of these vitamin supplements, but they're all dead. <laughs> and wow, I love that's that. Close. Yeah, yeah. Um, He's, this is a very interesting guy, by the way. Robert Cummings uh, was a flight instructor in World War II, just like his character in Beach Party. Uh, he, I have no idea. I mean, I assume that they made that character that way because of Robert Cummings. He was, uh, uh, he was related to, uh, I think, Orville Wright, who taught him to fly, which is really strange. Really? Godfa- really? Orville Wright was his godfather, yes. Uh, his he flew solo for the first time in 1927, and uh, then started giving um, giving flying classes. That's and so when really he was amazing. in the Army Air Corps, isn't it? <laughs> so, you know, so this is a very this is a very fascinating uh, guy. Anyway, um, it, it is it is very he he does dominate the film, and that's why you know they made this choice. They're hedging their bets in a sense because American International is like, we're going to make a movie that's going to focus heavily on this youth culture, but our way in is going to be this 53 year old man who wants to, who in a sense, like us, gets an opportunity to escape. He has an excuse, it's his profession, but he gets an opportunity to escape into their lifestyle. Um, But that's our way in. After this film, there are no more adults. After this film, you are firmly going to be resting on Frankie and Annette's shoulders. After this, the only adults will be people like, like, uh, you know, Mickey Rooney playing a concert promoter or, or, or something like that, you know, and, and you won't, you know, you'll, you'll no longer really particularly follow them. You might follow them for a scene. You'll firmly be in their world. Yes. And this is really the, the entree into, into their world. But they had their star when they started with Robert yes. Cummings, and and, it, and then, you know, it diegetically they were sort of, you know, uh, whether it was for adults or for for the younger generation, it was it was um, walking us into that world, you know, with enough of the the promise of you know of youth culture and sex and the, the endless party and whatever else. And it's interesting that 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 Robert Cummings is on the same sort of tiki quest, right? The yes. idea of you know, of escape and of, of digging into this in this world as the as the as the as I guess the film goer movie goer must have been you know seeing this movie and then it caught on. It was so interesting is yes. that we're you know I think people still see these movies and movies like them for the you know for that same sort of thing the idea of escape. But I mean it's interesting that I, I halfway wonder if these movies didn't exist back then if they if we hadn't been introduced to them and subsequent generations like ours that didn't really see them exactly when they came out, but we saw them years later, and that held up this idea we were on that same journey that by seeing this picture and then other ones, you know, whether, you know, whether not just these kind of movies, but, or the genre, but also the tiki culture would have, would have been the same, but just in its resurgence, yes. because we're also, I think, influenced by a lot of this as well. It didn't, maybe it didn't, we didn't see it all in the same order as the generations before us, but there's still this great sense of, you know, when you talk to people, they know about these movies, and there's 
the idea of just wanting to go hang out yeah. on the beach and to have the endless party and all that. And that all kind of comes from, I mean, there, there are no stakes in this. I mean, the worst, the worst that happens is, you know, and, and that's a little missed. And Frankie's a little put out. And Maury Amsterdam right. is there for whatever reason that Maury Amsterdam is there. Which again makes me laugh because it's oh, yeah. Maury Amsterdam. Maury Amsterdam. He runs a tiki bar. It's not called a tiki bar. It's just a bar. But I mean, you know, right. you have the masks. You have the 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 sort of the, the one major element of tiki is because it's very very Ameri- uh, you know white suburban middle class uh, eth- you know Eurocentric in a sense as far as uh, eth- ethnically then. Everything that is Eastern is extremely exotic. And so they've got all these, you know, fake Asian masks and, they, and yeah, they've got the palm trees and, and, and the straw hats and, and stuff like that in that bar that Mari Amsterdam is hanging out in. And he's reciting beat poetry. And he, Mari Amsterdam, is essentially an alter ego for Robert Cummings. And, and, and for the listener, if you're not familiar, R- Mari Amsterdam is the guy who played one of the writers on the Dick Van Dyke show. Uh, Completely. You know, so he's been around, yeah, forever. He's not a young man by any stretch. He's got a goatee. He's sort of ruling this roost for these teenagers to whom I guess he's selling, you know, soda and beer. Uh, and, you know, and he's basically just escaping from his life. You know, this right. is a weird life. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. The whole thing is like the, the escapist culture. But when you think of Maury Amsterdam, when we think of Maury Amsterdam as Dick Van Dyke to the other shows that he was in, but really he's a character actor who's, who looks completely different in this with the goatee and everything else. And he just looks like a guy who is now hiding on the beach and has, has basically bought his island and has basically, you know, has bought the, this is the, this is the place he works and he does this because, you, know, you know, he just wanted, you could picture that the guy who was in Dick Van Dyke, you know, taking the money from the show that he was on and just like, I'm going to go live on the West coast. And there was a move <laughs> from the East coast, to the West coast, by the way. So I could see him at that time making that move in television from East to West and saying, you know what, I'm going to now, this, my dream is to open up this place on the beach and you could totally see a place where that character, you know, from Dick Van Dyke, became this character a little bit later and grew a goatee and did beat poetry. It's a fascinating thing that I'm sure nobody intended, but it's completely in line, yeah. completely in line with, with tiki culture and with the and with kind of what it means and, and the idea of just, you know, ending up in your own personal um, exotic paradise, which in this case is, is his bar. Yeah, and, and it, it, he's... Um... And he's, it's an interesting commentary on what the culture is, you know, because we're seeing the culture at its purest form, which is, you know, a Frankie and Annette, and they get up in the morning from the house that they're renting, money is not a problem, and they're surfing all day. At, hey, like the song goes, they're surfing all day and swinging all night, right? And then Maury Amsterdam, he's letting us know that the culture is being created on the fly, that he's he's got yoga going. He doesn't really know anything about that. He's making up the beat poetry. None of it means anything to him. Um, but but clearly, yes, he's a, he's he's escaped uh, into all this. And the music um, is pure exotica, which is a whole. Uh, so there's two kinds of music going on in this movie. Uh, there's the music that is played like in the bar when, when Robert Cummings goes to visit, which is all exotica music, which is a whole kind of jazz. It's kind of a, a, a big band jazz that kind of sounded like, like fake Polynesian, lots of bongo drums and, and stuff like that. Les Baxter, the band right. leader is uh, the guy responsible Baxter. for the score here. Yeah, I mean, he's so Les Baxter, who is the king of exotica music, is in charge of the music here. But the the diegetic music, the the band that's playing whenever they are dancing and listening to live music is, oddly enough, Dick Dale, the surf king or the, you know, the, the king of surf. Although in this movie, he's not even really playing surf music. He's playing I, I don't know. He's playing basically rock. He's playing rock and roll, you know, and and kind of but he would have been attractive style. to people they would have been attractive to i think the to i don't know to a to a an audience who was just starting to understand what that music was yes you know i think that he, he would have been attractive even if he wasn't you know it's like having well it's not really a fair comparison to say you have elvis in a movie because he already was sort of a star by the time he was making movies but i mean you could there's a certain point where you know dick dale could have been a it could have been a draw i think even oh to yeah agree with it oh 
Well, like uh, uh, Dickdale's Surfer's Choice. So, so uh, Dickdale's LP, Surfer's Choice, which was I'm looking to make sure. Yes, Surfer's Choice came out in 1962, so it comes out really just before this movie comes out. It includes Miserloo, which is a big, big, massive hit. Having said that, this movie, this this uh, uh, album only gets up to like. 59 so so surf music hasn't quite hit that moment where it's literally everywhere but you know miserloo is a well-known piece but what's funny is the music that he's that he's playing in this in this movie yeah as you said it's movie that's sort of more palatable plus they kind of need to be dancing to faster rock and roll kind right, of songs more, more energetic yeah yeah, yeah. Because what is he going to be playing? I mean, Miserloo is a fast song, but you can't dance to it. It was more for, uh, I mean, or you would, but it's not that interesting on film. He, Dick Dale was really interesting because he was a part of, before he was a, a major star uh, in the couple of years before this movie comes out, Dick Dale is part of this enormous movement called Surf Stomps, which were these great big teenage concerts that where where surf bands would just play and everybody would dance all night and they would play like films that just showed people surfing you know just literally like sports films and you know not not movies not like beach movies but just you know like like here's highlights of of people surfing and he would play these surf stomps uh it's just weird to have him here playing a kind of a watered down version did you say you went to one I've been to one, yeah. It was a really long time ago, but I actually been to a sort of stop. Or, or that's or, cool. <laughs> yeah, they had they had they had is... them even you know some years ago. You know, they still kind of had them. It was a it was a slightly different event, but that's a it's not it hasn't hasn't diminished. Surprisingly, a, a generation of people who still sort of really dug that. That is really cool. But you know, in, in a lot of ways, you know, you if in a different time, and and if you were slightly more cynical, you would. And if I we didn't know that they were making up, or they were sort of going along. American International, you would say that this movie was really engineered to perform well um, mm-hmm. with, you know, with a particular segment or or a, a cluster of segments in the audience, and it wasn't it wasn't really the case, which is so interesting. I mean, they they tailored other films later to be more to, to perform well, but this is the thing that the recipe I think for it, they just had no idea, and they yeah. and they ended, ended up literally striking oil or, or, or actually capturing lightning and it really became, you know, something that was um that was patterned that, that people tried to pattern later, that people tried to, to replicate. It opened up the genre. It was really it's really interesting. But, you know, when you think about it, we'll have this star, we'll have Robert Cumming, we'll go ahead and we'll have Dick Dale and Delta. You know, we're gonna we're gonna make it this kind of way. If you look through the through the lens of time, um, you know, you say, Well the, these things all really hit. Would, the, would did they intend to do this? Did they do it what what some um, studios do uh, have done and do now, which is you know they take they package certain you know elements, certain actors, certain directors, certain genres together to make a certain kind of movie that will perform well in the marketplace. And you could say that 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 this looks like it might have been put together that way, but the fact that it wasn't that you know there was some you know definitely some choices that were made, but it was not it was not really engineered in the same way. It, it's just fascinating yeah. to look at. Like okay, that this somehow happened, and it had an impact on culture, and culture had an impact on it later, where it was when it was reinvented. These, these films were still being talked about. It uh, it, it as as we said, it, it could have turned out also to be uh, to be a flop, and and people wouldn't be interested in it, it because it was a huge hit there are multiple uh, uh stories of how the film actually came to be uh because everybody at aip wants to take credit for having come up with it and you know different says ah oh, samuel arkoff wasn't interested and others and samuel arkoff in his autobiography says that he came up with the idea after he he says he saw a movie that was about an older man taking up with a 20 year old girl on the beach and that it was about that. And he says, you know, I think there's something here if we just kind of make it more lightweight than all that. Right. You know, the, the, way that. The, the way we make it forgivable in this movie that Robert Cummings is spending all this time with, uh, with Annette Funicello is to make him more or less oblivious to her 
interest in him you know the for a bunch of the time she's not interested in him then when she becomes infatuated with him he's oblivious to it then when he's aware of it he thinks it's plainly absurd he's, he thinks it's so plainly absurd that he doesn't even give a moment's credence to it he instead immediately starts trying to figure out ways to to ditch her uh right it, and, is, it makes him sort of not creepy which is great right right because it would be you can't you it is totally plausible to imagine like a dudley moore kind of scenario where he becomes obsessed with with annette funicello but somehow sure. it's forgivable because dudley moore is such a dweeb but there's something about the aging matinee idol that would just be gross if yeah, if it's not Yves Montan. I mean, you know, you're not yeah. really. <laughs> so yeah, um, I I think that's I think that's handled uh, really well. I, instantly, the part of the the Maury Amsterdam part, because I don't know if on this podcast we're ever going to do any others of the beach movies, but Maury Amsterdam, his part will be taken up in later films, basically by Don Rickles. Don Rickles basically will do this over and over again. Where he, Which is another, he becomes... it's another kind of it's another kind of commentary when you think about it. and I love Don Rickles in a, yeah. in a lot of ways. You know, but there's a but Don Rickles always has the I mean from crap game, you know, and, and Kelly's Heroes to, you know, he acted well and well well into his his older years and was just great. Uh but he, yeah. you know there is a certain um, attitude and 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 a and a cynicism that, that he sort of had. You know, he was you know a famous insult comic. Um, yeah. You know, he was he, he reflected he you know he definitely reflected an American style and uh, and uh, and a and a sensibility and and I think it's interesting that that it kind of went from Maury Amsterdam to to kind of burying the needle, um, really burying yeah. the needle with. with with him, like so we're gonna double down on him, and you know, and, and and I love him, you know, but it's just a, it's an interesting choice. Well, he takes the air out of whatever it is, you know, it, it by having Don Rickles around. You know, if things start if things start to get heavy, Don Rickles is an insult comic, and he's going. He, I remember there's one of the movies where Don Rickles does a whole routine about how old Frankie Avalon looks. I mentioned it earlier that Frankie Avalon looks a lot older than 23. There's a there's a whole thing in one of them where he keeps calling Frankie Avalon 30, <laughs> and it's and it, it's it's great. You know, it's it's really neat. I wonder, is it possible that that's not that it's not even true that Frankie Avalon is older than that? Do we have the wrong age? Because this guy does not look twenty three. That, no, is, that is blowing my mind. mind. Neither one of them looks yeah. as, as well, you would say. As, as they're both great looking, but no. Yeah, you know, people. It's possible that people just aged faster. Uh, I should mention that Dwayne Hickman, who played the like young sidekick nephew in the Bob Cummings program, uh, will show up as sort of the alternating lead in these movies uh, whenever Frankie is like double okay, booked uh then dwayne, yeah. yeah then dwayne hickman would stick would would be the the basically the the male lead and sometimes he would be he would be second banana to frankie avalon but in some of the movies he's just he's just the guy uh and uh you know that was pretty cool and then he went off and did um adobe Yolos. so there you go i it, right, it is just the, remarkable to me that this go ahead no it, the particularly Doby Gillis, you know, whenever you think of Maury Amsterdam taking over the the bartender role in this, or starting the bartender role in this picture, mm-hmm. you know, you think of Doby Gillis, you know, also wearing a goatee, or, or rather, uh, that's uh, right, uh, Bob Denver, um, Bob Denver yeah. wearing a goatee, and Doby Gillis as Maynard G. Krabs, and you're going, God, he's just not the same character, but there is sort of this interesting vein of similarity. Yeah, um, and and actually, Bob Denver plays a role very similar to Maynard G. Krebs in 1960, I think it's 64. It's, it's, it's really shortly after Beach Party. So it depends on what part of the year Beach Party came out in. But there is this other movie called For Those Who Think Young, which was a quickly rushed out. Wow. It's not American International Pictures. It's another picture, but, uh, but uh, Bob Denver plays the um the sort of surf king in that film and i had my dates wrong in doby gillis doby gillis went from 1959 to 1963 so in fact doby gillis was just ending when uh, this movie came out and that explains why bob denver was uh was so available for uh, for those who for those who think young let me ask um, you was uh was uh, was 
was uh, Dr. Goldfoot in the Bikini Machine. Was that American International? Oh yes, absolutely. That one. Uh, that's that's Vincent Price and uh, Frankie, and I think Dwayne Hickman, right? Uh, or, I think. or um, and yeah, and that's that is part of this cycle of surf pictures and that's why it gets difficult to count how many surf pictures are because you have to answer the weird question of whether dr goldfoot counts uh you know and right it's, because... it's not immediately a surf picture at least at first lush dr <laughs> dr goldfoot in the bikini machine yeah and it, it has um it has frankie and Dwayne playing essentially their characters from uh ski party which is the the i mean literally the same names that they played in the characters of ski yeah. party although they're apparently different characters ski party is yet another one of these beach party movies except for that um they play they have different names from what they have on the beach parties and it takes place at a ski resort uh that by the way is a crazy film uh that one is basically a ripoff of uh some like it hot where where Frankie right. Avalon and Dwayne Hick decide that they got it they want to go skiing the only way they can go is if they weasel their way into the girls ski trip but to do so follow me here they have to pretend to be women uh, <laughs> where, uh -huh. where, yeah. and but uh they're in love let's see i think that Frankie's in love with like Barbara Feldman i think and so sure. and but she it but there's like and there's lots of like gay panic or like um like subtle gay humor all depending on how you want to view that film uh but yeah that's a that's definitely a, a really interesting uh film to watch ski party yeah some like it hot starring frankie avalon essentially oh my god uh, that's like I'm... yeah and and you know uh yeah this is a major spoiler but uh vincent price shows up at the end of this movie of beach party uh, just to say a couple lines and really just to act as a few moments of advertisement for the Edgar Allan Poe pictures that, that Vincent Price was sort of starting up, also at American it, International Pictures. Hitting hit the pendulum, maybe? Hitting the pendulum, yeah. Yeah, that's why the lines that he says, whatever stupid little poem he reads, are, are essentially a, you know, a, a little ad for Pitting the Pendulum. It's weird. I love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it looks like, uh, fr yeah, Frankie and Dwayne. Yeah, I was just trying to ch check on who was in Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine. The weird thing is I could swear that in the next one, Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs, that it right. was not Frankie, that that one of them no. is missing. One of them is missing in yeah, that. I don't know which one it is. I remember, seeing, I remember seeing that movie. Uh <laughs> I really, I really do. Uh, Is they're girl bombs, so they're basically fembots. Uh, right. They yeah. Pre, it was pre, pre fembot. Those are crazy movies. That was Later. like Austin Powers was trading off of once upon a, once upon a time. You know, it wasn't yeah. quite like having Boris Karloff in the Ghost in the Invisible Bikini. So now we're really getting off on a whole series of tangents. Oh my but, God. Yeah. Well, you did the episode of the Castle of Horror podcast with us on Ghost in, yes. Ghost in the Invisible Bikini, didn't you? I, oh my God. And Eric Von Zipper's in that one too. The That's Freddy, right. uh, 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 Harvey Lembeck, uh, who by the way is, is in this movie 40 years old. So you have to remember that this is a 40 year old man wandering around with, as a, as a clown on a motorcycle, uh, among all these teenagers, it, it's have you it's been to LA? Have you been here? Have you been here? Have you been to Beach? Have you been to Venice Beach? Go on. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me now, you know. But that's um, yeah, Harvey Limbeck is is pretty cool. But anyway, he shows up again, yeah, with the same sort of broad humor, the same stupid sound effects, all of all of that stuff. Uh, that um, that was a fun episode of Castle of Horror. Anyway. Uh, we should probably wrap this up. Uh, the, uh, you know, I think we've touched on just about everything as far as the themes of Beach Party, and certainly yep. that it is super important uh, to the culture. This is one of the ones that we actually talk about in the chapter on uh, on tiki movies in uh, California tiki. So 
you know, I, I'm sure that we go on more at length in, in the actual book on this one. So I have no idea yeah, what we're are. going to discuss. I don't know what we're going to discuss in the next episode, but uh, this has been really fun talking about, about Beach Party. Uh, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? No, actually, I, I kind of would like to, you know, uh, despite the fact that I I hadn't seen this movie in a while, I, I, upon seeing it again, it makes me want to sort of rewatch the other one. No, it's very, you know, it's a very, it's a very fun movie. And if you haven't seen seen it you probably should because it's very you know check your expectations at the door yeah. but it really is a fascinating insight to, to to movie culture at the time and and really the beginnings of uh, you know this this movement you know post-world war ii and kind of as tiki was rising up in uh, in the u.s um and it's just fascinating if it opened a door for an entire generation to sort of step into and, and that was a wave that was written for some some decades really and and, and then rediscovered um, so, you know, I'm excited that we kind of had this as our, as our kickoff episode. I kind of want to see what we're going to do next. I, I'm, I'm excited to, to figure that out, uh, as well. And, and, and this was, this was a lot of fun to go into. I, especially because this is definitely the one that is aimed at, that introduces you to that youth culture, but is really aimed at adults and, and is, is uh is all the stranger for it because it's you talked about checking your expectations at the door and that's certainly true for the weird things that are of a time like the sound effects and and the goofiness yeah. and all that stuff and at the same time uh it's it's just literally it's not the movie that you expect it to be because of the presence of the whole love love story between Dorothy Malone and Robert Cummings which takes up frankly half the movie and and uh it's uh, that's pretty interesting. So, uh, as a, as a final, as a final thought, if you like Dorothy, Mal you should definitely check out these other ones, but if you like Dorothy Malone, watch some Peyton place, because that is, that's a really wow. interesting, yeah. yeah, for sure. And they're all on YouTube. So, you know, this is a woman who could really act with her eyes. She was very, very talented. She did win an Oscar, um, prior to this. Uh, and I think, um, what movie was for written on the wind and uh, she won an Oscar for best supporting actress. And then after, you know, after that, it sort of cooled off. She became a big TV star for a really long time. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of these uh, as we, as we lead up to the Tiki Oasis event where we'll be signing copies of California Tiki and yep. have a fantastic uh, week. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. Yes, sir. Bye. <laughs>